I debated for a while, but I feel strongly impressed, um, and it's not what I normally do, but to tell you um, my testimony of how I came to know God, because it shows so clearly what um, is necessary uh, for someone to come to an understanding of what sin really is in order to know who the Savior is and why you need one. Um, and uh, I am just so grateful that God didn't leave me in a half-baked state where, like Mirji was, she was in a charismatic church and things had changed a little bit and she knew that God was real and that he loved her, but he didn't leave her there. And uh, God didn't leave me there either. Um, I grew up in a, uh, my father, my mother and father were missionaries in Uganda and uh, in the Church of England. And uh, when I was four, we came back to this country. Uh, and I would say that um, probably my father had an experience of salvation, but my mother never did. She believed that her intellect was above the Bible. But that's not an excuse for the state that I was in. Um, so I grew up in a home, uh, and uh, to be honest, I, I can't say I remember a single word my father preached. I'm, I couldn't, can't. Nothing made an impression on, on me at all. <laughs> it's not his, necessarily his fault, but it certainly didn't make an impression on me. And uh, it wasn't until I went to a youth camp at the age of Eight, uh, 17 um, in North Devon uh, that I met people who had a joy and Christianity seemed to be working for them in a way that I'd never seen before and uh, so what I came what I th understood in that conference in that youth camp was that what I wanted was the joy that people had and so at the end of the camp, when they called people forward, I went forward to ask God for the joy that those people had. And that's what God did for me. Things changed inside, and I had a joy. And for the first time in my life, I really wanted to read the Bible. And it made sense to me for the first time in my life. Then I went to university, and... Uh, I studied Chinese and sociology. I was going to be the second Gladys Aylward. <laughs> Isn't it strange how religion changes your, your ambitions, take on a religious guise? So I was going to be someone famous, a famous missionary, you know, and uh, second, I was studying Chinese. There weren't many people who studied Chinese. And uh, so I was going to be the second Gladys Aylward. That was my thought. And, uh, but as I was at university, I had had quite a sheltered upbringing. I tried the other side of life. And uh, I was someone who was straddling the church, uh, living a Christian life and living in the world. Living a church, no, not a Christian life, a church life and living in the world. And the more I went on, the more of a mess I got into. I had unhappy relationships with people. It ended up in a total and utter mess. Thank God it did. But it just meant that I, I was more and more unhappy in that way. And so I w uh, finished university. I went to work as a social worker, uh, childcare officer in Liverpool. And uh, if any of you know Liverpool, <laughs> my eyes were opened in a way I <laughs> had never understood being brought up in the sheltered life of a vicarage. And the first, um, first family I visited with, this, with the social worker who was taking care of me, um, they'd had uh, the family, uh, we, we arrived there, dad was, um, had his arm in a sling and a big black eye and the, br and, uh, the son um, was off work and he was bruised all over. And uh, the, so the social worker said to them, what has happened to you? Oh, we went to a wedding. <laughs> it, <laughs> 
and her side didn't fight fair. They bought bottles and chains. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, um, Jeanette, who's uh, in, the, in the congregation here, her mother had a, a hotel up in uh, Yorkshire, and she says that she never had been to her wedding until she came to Penal, where it didn't end in a fight. <laughs> I mean, I saw, bless, I saw things that I just didn't understand, didn't know how to deal with. I, can you imagine what I said to people? Um, a little green thing from a vicarage <laughs> trying to tell mothers what to do with their children. Oh, can you, be, I just dread to think. Fortunately, I can't remember. <laughs> Well, I dread to think what I said. <laughs> and uh, I went to this little Pentecostal church. And uh, it was a mess, this little Pentecostal church, an absolute mess. The elders were fighting. The, um, uh, the, it was just... Um, <laughs> a disaster. One time I can remember they had a prophet come um, to the service and uh, they were, he, he stood up and he started to shake all over and, and he said, and God has written over this church Ichabod. <laughs> and I thought, oh, help, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what made me stay there, but I did. <laughs> and uh, fortunately I did because there was a man came to preach on a series of three sermons and it was supposed to be a very special occasion. His name was Graham Perrins. And uh, so I thought, well, this would be good. I, I'm going to enjoy this. I'll have I'll come along for the three services and uh, it's going to be a, a nice time. And he started his first sermon by preaching on, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so talking about what you are inside is what you really are, not what you put on the outside, because we make a very good effort of painting the outside and making it look nice. So, and I certainly did that. Um, and the, I began to feel more and more and more uncomfortable. And I didn't understand why I felt uncomfortable. I really felt bad. And I thought, well, this is strange. Why do I feel so bad when I'm meant to be enjoying these services? Um, but I didn't understand what was happening to me. It was conviction of sin. But if you'd have told me that, I would have said I was a good person. Well, what would I need conviction of sin for? Um, and after all, I'd had an experience of God, and he'd given me that joy. And I, mind you, by after about three months, that had disappeared. Um, and I had tried along the way. I had tried to speak in tongues. I'd heard about the baptism in the Spirit. I went to a little Pentecostal church in London. They, put, they all stood around me praying for me. And they told me to repeat the blood of Jesus over and over again. And I would start to speak in tongues. Well, I did that. And I did, I suppose, start to speak in tongues, in inverted commas. Um, but I knew more than to... Re that experience left me absolutely cold. I thought, well, that's not what I read in the Bible about being baptized in the Spirit. That's not, that can't be right. But I didn't know what was right. And I didn't know how to find what was right. I tried. I tried fasting. I tried praying. I tried this. I tried that. None of it did anything. And none of it worked. But this man began to really get to me and what he had to say. And on the third service, he said, this church is like a darkened glass. And uh, there are black spots on the glass. 
And God spoke to me for the first time in my life. He said, you're one of those black spots. You could have hit me with a two by four and knocked me over with a feather. I said, me? A, a black spot, but I'm a good person. God's lucky to have me on his side. <laughs> you don't realize my family is intellectual. I mean, anyone who believes in God's doing him a favor. Because <laughs> look at all these people that don't believe in him. Uh, how, what do you say? I'm a, I, I, I'm a sinner. And at that point, I had a vision of hell. This is all in a service. And I heard the people screaming. I saw the flames. I smelt the smoke. It was so real. And I saw the people falling into hell. And then I felt as though I was falling into hell. And at the top of my voice, from an Anglican background, I yelled, Lord Jesus, save me! Because it was so real, so real. And the vision disappeared, and I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed to the end of the service. So at the end of the service, I went up to Graham, and I said to him, uh, would you mind telling me what all that was about? And he looked at me and he said, I've got two words for you. I said, well, what's that? He said, humble yourself. What does that mean? <laughs> but I didn't dare ask him in case he said something horrible. <laughs> and so I left, I left it and I went home. And I thought to myself, well, I can't ask anybody but I can ask God. So I knelt down by my bed and I said, Lord, what does it mean? Humble yourself. And he showed me what my life was really like, like a book, turning the pages, he showed me. He showed me that my family from, oh, I was an intellectual snob. I didn't really pay any attention to anybody who didn't have a degree especially if they were preachers and they didn't have a degree. Didn't come from good, you know, good university background. That's, uh, that was where my uh, family were. Um, I believed that I was doing God a favor to believe in him. I believed that um, the people that I visited as a social worker, God showed me I was not visiting them to help them, I was, I was doing social work to make myself feel good because I was, my, I was comparing my life with theirs and saying, well, I'm doing okay because they're in such a mess. So I compared my life with theirs and thought, well, I'm fine. I'm a good person. I'm not in the mess they're in. And so, and then... I was just completely blind. I didn't believe in Adam and Eve. I didn't believe in the creation story. My, my, my intellect was far above that. What did uh, God think, you know, uh, that uh, I had to believe in fairy tales? Um, I believed, uh, it, the, it went on, and God showed me the motives. As a man thinketh in his heart, the motives for why I did what I did. And when I discovered the motives, you could have knocked me over with a feather. If you'd told me that the day before, I would have been amazed. You see, that's what Midri was saying. It makes you blind. Those, once I was blind and now I see, it, I was completely and utterly blind. The Bible says Satan hath blinded the minds it's so true. We're so blinded until we know. And there's such a fog. Um, Bishop Reed was preaching just before we went to um, Australia. And he was talking about that verse where it says, he lifted a veil from off the minds. 
And if you can picture that, it's like having a complete shroud taken off your mind. And suddenly, whereas you thought you saw, you, suddenly you realize that that was a shroud and you couldn't see. And this shroud needed to be taken off. And suddenly when it was taken off and you realized it was there, wow, at last you could see what, it was, what you were really like. And why you needed a savior. You see, I, had, I said to God as I knelt there, I realized I deserve to go to hell. There was every reason why I should go to hell. And I didn't believe in to hell up and hell up to that point. <laughs> but I certainly did after that. I didn't believe that anyone, God would send anyone to hell. And he doesn't want to send anyone to hell. He's made a provision so we don't have to go there. But it's real. I realized I deserved it. And like the woman, Jesus called her a dog. And she said, true Lord. I had to say to the Lord, everything you say about me is absolutely true. It's right. You're right, Lord. I have no excuse. You're absolutely right about me. And when I did that, the love of God just flooded me through and through from the top of from my toes to the top of my head. Up and down, up and down, up and down. My whole life was transformed absolutely there and then. And all the weight of sin went, and all the past went, and all the mistakes went, and everything became new. And it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And as I began to, as I lay there and, and just bathing in the love of God, all of a sudden I began to speak in tongues, really speak in tongues. Not that awful experience I had had where I said the blood of Jesus over and over and over again. It was the real thing. And then I heard God calling me his child. And I knew that I could call him my father. And I just was saying, Father, 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 over and over and over again. I was a child of God. I belonged to him. Now, the reason I was hesitant to give you my testimony was because people compare themselves with themselves. And the Bible says it's not wise. God's not going to deal with you how he dealt with me. But what I'm saying is, if he'd left me in the previous state, I would have been all these years not knowing that I needed a savior. And so what Mary was sharing with you is so important. It's so unfriendly, not seeker friendly, it's seeker unfriendly, not to tell them what state they're in. Not to tell them that there's a savior. Not to tell them the reason why they need a savior. It's seeker unfriendly. It's the worst thing you could do for anybody. To leave them with that veil over their mind. To leave them with that blindness. To leave them with the delusion that their mind, that the Satan puts them in. That things are okay. You really are all right. You're not that bad. You really don't do such awful things. Well, you might make a mistake every now and again, but you're kind to cats and dogs. <laughs> People have all kinds of excuses for thinking that they're a good person. Well, I'm nice to this person or that person. Oh, I'm, you know, I don't hate everybody. Um, uh, you know, there's only a few people, and I'm such a loving person until you scratch what's underneath. <laughs> so, 
that's, to me, it's so important that people know why they need a savior. And the only way you know why you need a savior is people need to know that they're a sinner. And sin is the real problem. Okay, let's start. We go to, we turn to Genesis chapter three. The wonders of incarnation, I've called this. To me, it's just so fantastic. Jesus Christ, God's son, was born of a woman. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. When we know that the woman made a big old boo-boo right from the beginning, <laughs> that made a big, big trouble for the rest of us. The woman seemed to have cursed mankind forever. But God, this is God. God used women to restore his image in the perfect man by the seed of woman, Jesus Christ. Isn't it fantastic? Nothing is beyond God's redemption. It looked as though women had cooked it forever, but God doesn't let women cook it forever. He used a woman to restore that back again. And he used a man, Jesus Christ, to restore back what Adam had done. Isn't that fantastic? I think that's only God who could have a plan like that. Only God could use, restore, redeem, put us back again, make us whole again, do something to right whatever had gone wrong. Only God would think of a plan like that. And only God would have the love to consider, to forgive, and to forget. And he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, that he's talking to Satan, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Who or what are the seed, Satan's seed? Jesus um, left, left people in no doubt. <laughs> Let's look at Matthew 23, 33. Now you see, if you've read this verse where um, Jesus taught, if you read these verses in Genesis, where Jesus is talking of Satan as a serpent, um, and, dealing, and Satan is pictured as a serpent, just think about what effect this had on the people Jesus called serpents and vipers. He called the Pharisees and scribes. He called them, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? They would have understood very clearly what he was calling them. <laughs> huh? That's why it made them mad. How dare he call us serpents? They knew who the, Jesus was, rep, uh, who, what the serpent represented. Absolutely the devil. They would have been as mad as dingbats to have been called that. And he not only called them that, but he called them other things as well, which left them in no doubt. John 8. And um, in this... Uh, chapter <laughs> the Pharisees tell Jesus but in verse 33 but we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man how sayest thou you shall be made free so they're saying to Jesus we're children of Abraham we're children of the father of the faith and Jesus leaves them in no doubt. He says, excuse me, you've got things wrong. <laughs> you know who your real father is? The devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. You will act like the devil and you are children of the devil. Well, can you imagine what that did to them? The religious people? Oh, who had such a wonderful outside, who painted it beautifully. 
Jesus called them dead men's sepulchres, um, whited sepulchres full of dead men's bones. <laughs> Painted on the outside, looking lovely, all religious, yes. And so full of deadness on the inside. And uh, you see, I would have said that. How, how could God say that I've got, I wasn't like those Pharisees. I didn't kill Jesus. I didn't say crucify him, crucify him. Well, what, I mean, I wasn't like that. Maybe you, you found an excuse for yourself. Say, oh, well, I'm not a Pharisee. But a Pharisee is only someone who puts a good thing on the outside and it still has not dealt with the inside. That's all a Pharisee is. It's not, you know, you don't have to plait your hair and put tassels on your garments and uh, wander around like you sometimes see the Jews, uh, the more strict Jews doing, um, muttering to themselves and pretending to pray and doing all this stuff. And um, that's not what a true Pharisee is. A Pharisee is someone who paints the outside to look good and is something different on the inside. That's what I did. But if you'd asked me, I would say, oh, I'm not a Pharisee. I'm not one of those people. A Pharisee is just a hypocrite. That's all. So uh, maybe you think that you've got some little escape. <laughs> but let's go on. Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation, that means our manner of life, in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Any of us got an escape? <laughs> Anyone find a little wiggle, wriggle room? <laughs> Anyone say, oh, well, I can't believe I really, my father really is the devil. Ooh, that's horrible. How could you say that about me? Is there a little wriggle room somewhere? No. The Bible says we all had our, com our manner of life like that in times past. Fulfilling the lusts of our flesh and the desires of our mind. That's where we were. So there isn't an ex... When I ask what or who are Satan's seed, we all know that at one time or another, we were Satan's seed. And we need to change our father. We need to change from being in the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We need to change. We need to change from one place to the other. J Jesus Christ has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. It's chalk from cheese. It's light from darkness. It's wonderful, but it has to happen. It has to change. It has to be as radical as it can be because Changing from being a child of the devil to being the child of the most wonderful father, our Lord God, has to be a big, big change. And it's not something we can do. God has to do it. Jeez, how do you think by deciding to change a little bit or alter this piece of behavior, like Mary was saying, and behavior modification, anger management, you know, people go on courses for anger management, and they do work a little bit, uh, but it's not dealing with the root. And so we have to change completely, and we can't do that. We can't change ourselves so completely, but God can, and God does, and God does a fantastic work. And so when it says, he translates us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear, his dear son. It's totally opposite. It's totally different. And it's totally wonderful. And it's totally fantastic. And it's totally marvelous. 
And it's just amazing. And you think to yourself, why did I ever want to stay the other side of the fence? <laughs> why did I ever want the devil for my father? Why did I want to be at his mercy? Because as Bishop Reed said last night, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. What do we ever want to stay with him for? Only because we want our own way and our own will. That's the only reason why we'd ever stay with him. And so we have no doubt and we have no wriggle room from knowing that we all were under the prince of the power of the air. And that is Satan. We have no excuse. There is only one seed of woman who bruised the serpent's head. Let's go to the next one. Genesis 3 verse 15. Go back there. There will be enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Bible's not talking, the Bible doesn't say that there were lots of people that would bruise the serpent's head. It's talking in the singular. One would do the whole thing. Jesus Christ is the one who did it. The seed of woman bruised the serpent's head. The seed of woman, Jesus Christ, was the one who did it. 1 John 3, uh, let's look at that, 1 to 9. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The wonder of it is that when we see him, we'll be like him. Isn't that amazing? God will have done such a transformation in your life by the power of the Spirit that you will be like Jesus. Amazing. Isn't that wonderful? And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither hath known him. Wow, I used to find that verse so difficult. <laughs> That's not nice. Can he really mean that? Oh, ouch. <laughs> Oh, he's talking about sinless perfection. That must be the, what the problem is. He was mistaken. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin, here it comes, yuck, is of the devil. Wah! For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Ah. <laughs> Whoa. Yo. That's not nice, is it? Ooh. As Marilyn Hickey would say, yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> Unless you know that the truth is true. He that committeth sin is of the devil. So what do you say? Well, what happens if I do sin? Jesus has made a provision. But it's not the generality. It shouldn't be. Jesus, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our, all our sins. If we sin, not when we sin, if we sin, there's a solution. Repentance, 
as my husband said last night, it's not crying and blubbering and saying I'm sorry. Repentance is deciding to turn the other way and live completely differently. That's what repentance is. And so your whole set, your whole bent is to go God's way. Okay, you make mistakes. Okay, you do fall. Okay, but it's if, not when. And I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I'm not talking about anything that's destructive. I'm talking about the life of God living inside. And that life, that life does not sin. And if you let that life rule and reign in you, you won't either. Because you couldn't, because you can't displease the one you love. But now I'm not saying that we don't sin. I'm not saying that we can't sin. I'm saying if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, okay? So don't say she's talking about sinless perfection. I'm not. I'm well aware that we do sin and we do make mistakes. <laughs> Even after we've become a Christian. Okay, yeah, but it's if, not when. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of sin doth not commit sin. Born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You see, we had two problems. Mary's quite right. The one problem that now is that the devil has been dealt with. On Calvary, he was dealt with. But man had two problems, the Satan and sin. There were two problems. And Jesus has dealt with both those problems. He has dealt with sin and he's dealt with Satan. Sin was dealt with on the cross. Satan was dealt with on the cross. And so we read here in this verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Who is that seed or what is that seed? Jesus Christ. So when the life of Christ comes in, that seed is incorruptible. That seed cannot sin. That's what John is saying. When we have the life of Christ within, he's likening it to a seed. The Bible, uh, we have to uh, describe things by metaphors. We can't describe spiritual things in, a, in any other, because it's spiritual. We have to have a kind of concrete way of describing it. And John's talking about it as a seed. The life of Christ comes to dwell deep within us. And that life of Christ cannot sin, cannot. Jesus Christ lived on this earth, he was tempted in all points like we are, and he did not sin. And so he's not gonna start now, is he? Hey? <laughs> so that life of Christ is inside us. That life of Christ is what cannot sin. We can sin, but that life of Christ can't. Now it depends whether you allow the life of Christ to work in you and stop you from sinning or you allow yourself to become ascendant again and you decide what you want to do. We have to live our life obedient to God. It's just so simple. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. All we have to do is be obedient to God. So, so easy. So, so simple. He will make it clear if you've gone wrong, he'll tell you. Don't think he won't because he loves you and he wants you to know what's wrong. Okay. That seed inside us 
performs miracle day after day after day after day. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. Isn't that wonderful? Faultless in that day. A whole life long as though nothing you've done ever done wrong. In that day he will present you faultless. Let's look at that verse in Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep him from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Savior. To the only wise God and our Savior, to be, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. It is absolutely amazing that God, Jesus Christ, that seed inside you, can keep you all the days of your life till that day when you meet him in the air, when you, till that day when you're called home, till that day. And you won't, you won't suddenly change. There, is a, there are doctrines which say you'll suddenly change when you, you meet him. <laughs> no way, Jose. That change has to come now, not then. <laughs> that change has to come now. And when that change has happened, when that seed, which is incorruptible, lives inside you and you allow him to rule and reign in your heart and life, he'll keep you faultless till the day. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Isn't that amazing? I think it's fantastic. It thrills my heart. Uh, Colossians 3, verse 3. Okay, verse, verse 1. If you then, being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. The Bible, Paul talks in several of the epistles about how we are dead to sin now. You're dead to sin, not to live any longer therein. But we have a changed life, a changed way of doing, a changed motivation, a changed thing that drives us. The thing that no, drives us now is not sin and the nature of sin. The thing that drives us now is the love of God. The thing that drives us now is that seed that cannot be corrupted, that lives inside us. That wonderful, wonderful seed that allows us to live a godly life, that allows us to live the life as God intended it to be, that restores the image of Christ back to man, that restores the image of God back to man, that allows man to be what God always intended him to be instead of a failure, a sinner, a murderer, someone who destroys, someone who builds, someone who has the answer, someone who is a voice, someone who gives people hope, someone says there's a savior, someone says there's a healer, someone who says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The good news, someone who has wonderful good news to tell the whole world. You don't have to be like you are. Jesus Christ can change the very wellspring of your being and he will change it utterly, totally and completely. You will not be the person that you're born. You were born. You'll be a new creature in Christ. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. And all things are of God. That wonderful seed inside can live there and control your life so that you're not the person you were born. It's amazing because Jesus Christ changes everything. He changes it all about you. And that seed remains in you and lives his life in you in a victorious way so that you're not constantly falling you're not constantly 
finding that things go wrong. You're not constantly finding that you, you feel guilty. And the most wonderful, wonderful thing in the world is not to feel guilty. Your sin is divided from you as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. God forgets your past. Forgets. And when God forgets, he says it's no more. It's as though it never happened. You don't have a past, Bishop Reed always says. You have a future. Isn't that wonderful? Absolutely wonderful. Why wouldn't people want this salvation? Why would people want to stay in their old state? Why would they want to fr seek a friendly gospel that doesn't tell them what their old state is so that they can have the new one? I can't understand it. To me, it's a crazy doctrine because when you know what the real problem is and you have the solution, that is fantastic. That is the best thing that could ever happen to you. Okay, let's go on. Let's look at, I mean, why would anyone want to be the person that they were born? When you see a verse like this, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God. Look at that. That's something that people never add on because of, uh, unfortunately they stop at all things become new. But look at that. And all things are of God. Is that possible? All things are of God in my life? Yes, if you let that seed that wonderful, incorruptible seed be the ruler of your life. How do you put it when John says that as he is, so are we in this world? You know, John said some shocking things. As he is, so are we in this world. Not as he was, we might be one day in this world. As he is. It doesn't say as he is, I am in this world. It says we. We, the body of Christ, truly are the representative of Jesus Christ in this world. We, the church, are the representative of Jesus Christ in this world. We, as he is, so are we in this world. I love that song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. You're the only Jesus some will ever see. And the truth is, the church is the only way that people will recognize Jesus Christ. And it's sad, isn't it, when the church is not telling people the right things. It's sad when they're not really the representatives of Jesus Christ. It's sad when there are no miracles. It's so, part of the gospel is miracles. You can't have the gospel without miracles. You can't have the good news without miracles. Why is it good news? If it's just a philosophy, why would you bother with it? But because there's miracles, because Jesus came, and what he did was heal the sick, deliver the captive, show what the love of God is like. That's how he did it. And so today, we need miracles in the church. We need people to see that God is real. We need people to understand that God really, really is the same as he was 2,000 years ago. He still is alive today. And that's the only way we can prove it. Paul, T.L. Osborne says, settles the issue. 
he went to India when he first got converted, uh, when he first went out onto the mission field. And uh, he came back absolutely disillusioned after about 18 months out there because he found that he had no answer because if he presented his little black book, they said, well, we've got a little black book. We've got, sorry, we've got the Quran. We've got our holy writings. We've got what, what makes it different. And he had no answer. He had no answer. And it wasn't until he came back and he cried out to God for help and he had a vision of Jesus that things totally changed for him. And he had the most amazing miracle ministry that has preached to thousands and thousands and thousands all over the world in the last century. What have we got if we haven't got miracles? What have we got if we don't have the demonstration of Jesus Christ? The gospel, the good news, is the power of God unto salvation. It's what proves that it's real. It's what makes people sit up and think. It's what made Bishop Reed, uh, an atheistic policeman, seeing miracles of drug addicts being delivered and prostitutes being delivered and people that he locked away and knew there was no answer for, these people were saying that Jesus Christ could change them forever. And that really made him sit up and think. That really caught his attention. And so we have a wonderful gospel. We have a wonderful savior. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. The wonderful news that man can be reconciled to God and there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height nor depth nor anything can separate you from the love of God. Isn't that wonderful? That's marvelous. Let's go on. Let's look at uh, Colossians 2, verse 15. This is just another way of saying what I've already said, but it's just, it's so wonderful to have it repeated in a different way. And you, bent, verse 13, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Um, I'm, I don't know whether you've had that verse 14 explained to you, but it's worth repeating that um, in Roman times, they had the, when the person was um, crucified, on the on the um, cross that they were crucified on, they had a list of all the things that they'd done wrong. And so that was nailed to the cross, and uh, that was their punishment, that was their judgment. That was it, why they were being crucified. That was why they were, their life was taken. That w so that handwriting of ordinances was everything that you or I have ever done wrong. That's what Jesus is referring to, what Paul is referring to there. And so Jesus Christ took the inventory of your life, all the ordinances that were against you, he wrote them all down, and they were nailed to his cross instead of yours. And he took them all, every single one, every single one so that your past, 
is no more. All those ordinances, all those things that you live with guilt forevermore are gone. Just gone. Jesus, my precious Jesus, took them for me.